Hey everybody, Tim Albrecht here, and thank you for listening to the YFP Podcast, where each week we strive to inspire and encourage you on your path towards achieving financial freedom. This week, I had a chance to welcome a 2022 graduate of Ohio Northern University, Dr. Alexis Miller, to talk about her journey graduating from pharmacy school debt-free. Not just from scholarships or from selling her cows, yes, you heard me right, from selling her cows, but also because of her service to our country by joining the Army in 2017. Some of my favorite moments from the show include hearing Alexis talk about why she decided to make the decision to join the Army while in pharmacy school, the ins and outs of the GI Bill and tuition assistance, and what she learned about herself during the journey of completing pharmacy school and joining the Army, and why she realized that bare minimum is not in her DNA. Now, before we jump into the show, I recognize that many listeners may not be aware of what the team at YFP Planning does in working one-on-one with more than 240 households in 40 plus states. YFP Planning offers fee-only high-touch financial planning that is customized to the pharmacy professional. If you're interested in learning more about how working one-on-one with a certified financial planner may help you achieve your financial goals, you can book a free discovery call at yfpplanning.com. Whether or not YFP Planning's financial planning services are a good fit for you, know that we appreciate your support of this podcast and our mission to help pharmacists achieve financial freedom. Okay, let's jump into my interview with Dr. Alexis Miller. Alexis, welcome to the show. Hello, it's so exciting to be here today. Well, in the intro I put together for the show, I I referenced you were a 2022 grad of Ohio Northern University, go go Polar Bears, and now officially Dr. Alexis Miller. So how does it feel to finally be done with pharmacy school? I think the moment that you graduate and you realize you're done, it's just, it's absolutely surreal because you've spent the last really 20 some years of your life being a student and that's all you've been used to. And at that point, you're like, wow, like I am done. And quite frankly, I don't necessarily know how to pursue the next step. Like, I don't know what awaits me, but I guess I'm ready for the world. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And I'm, I'm excited to dig into your story and share how you were able to graduate debt-free from Ohio Northern University this year. And, you know, we often talk on this show about debt repayment strategies, or we've shared debt-free journeys where, you know, folks have really worked hard or through forgiveness programs to get to the point of having no more student loan debt. This is different because you avoided it altogether. And we're going to talk about how you were able to do that through the journey that you've taken. You posted this uh, on LinkedIn a couple months ago. That post went viral. I think maybe surprised you a little bit as well. Had almost 30,000 reactions and excited to share your story with the YFP community. But before we get into that story, tell me a little bit more about your interest in pharmacy and what ultimately drew you into the profession. I always like to say it wasn't necessarily why I joined pharmacy, just because with Ohio Northern, it is a direct admit program. You're joining as you are still a high school senior. So I was 17 years old and really didn't have any idea of what I was going to do with my life or really what I necessarily wanted. But I always say it's really what made you stay in pharmacy, especially in a direct admit program like that. Mm -hmm. You have so many opportunities as you're going through to change your major, get out, take a whole completely new path. And I always like to say it was a lot of the people that I encountered between doing experiential hours or my internships, and even the people that I just went to school with, I realized like those were the kind of people that I wanted to work with for the rest of my life. And those were the kind of people that I wanted to impact. And that was the thing that I couldn't give up. So even when pharmacy school got to be at the point where I didn't know if it was for me anymore, it was always the people that were really telling me I could do this every day. I love that. One of the things I, I like to talk about is that your your why and your purpose has to be stronger than your motivation because your motivation can wax or wane, right? You live that firsthand in pharmacy school. There's some tough seasons, but if you've got a strong purpose and why of, of what you're doing and, and why you're doing it, I think that can really carry carry through. So that's really cool to hear that. Alexis, I'm going to share your post, what you wrote on LinkedIn that that really garnered you know so much attention. And then I'm going to ask you kind of how you got to the decision that you did. So you said, In September 2017, I decided the only way for me to complete my pharmacy degree without being in debt was to join the Army. I joked that I was, quote, young and dumb, signing my name on the dotted line, committing myself as a pharmacy student to basic training and six years as a truck driver. I was enticed by the idea of the GI Bill and tuition assistance, and my original plan was doing the bare minimum to get my degree paid for, getting in, getting paid, and getting out. 
Today, I pinned staff sergeant at only four and a half years in the army. So first of all, congratulations. Uh, r- really appreciate you. your commitment and your service. My, my question is, I think this thought maybe has crossed other folks' mind, especially in the health professions and in pharmacy, but few, I think, actually make the decision to move forward. So how, do you come, how did you come about this opportunity and why did you ultimately make the decision to go forward? So when I started my freshman year throughout high school and summers and everything else, I came from a farm. So I was selling livestock, I was selling animals, and I was, st- I was selling crops. And I had this dream that with my cows, I was going to pay for my school. But it came down to freshman year. After one year of tuition, I had about $1,000 left and five more years of school. And I realized that my goal of graduating debt-free, if I were just trying to do it on cows, really wasn't going to work anymore. And I was already paying for school with cows. It was already a very abnormal decision. So I just kind of looked around, shopped around. I was like, how can I get this paid for now? And maybe in the generation of instant gratification, the first thing that I found was the army. Hmm. And I ended up in a recruiter's office and was talking about the opportunities, the options, and essentially how much I could make out of it. And of course, like the idea is very scary. So I kind of got myself in a position where it's like, I have to commit now or I'm going to change my mind. So I just immediately was commit to the bit. Let's go. So Alexis, would this have been during, I'm trying to think 2017, would this have been your P2 year? So you were still like in pre-pharmacy? Yes. Okay. You know, I think of back to my time in academia and if a student would have come to me, I did a lot of career counseling with students. If a student would have come to me and said, Hey Tim, I want to join the army. I would have been like, uh, I don't know how to help you, but you know, let, let me find out. And I don't think this is an area that we talk enough about from a career development opportunity standpoint. So how did you navigate finding that information? You know, because I think for, for others that are listening that are thinking, Hey, I didn't think about this pathway. Maybe it's something I consider where, where could one go? So tell us more about how you're able to navigate this opportunity. So a lot of it myself was where I started was with Google of like, what recruiters are in my area? Who can I talk to? In terms of my family, I don't have any military background in my family, and especially at school. And Ohio and Northern are private school as well. I knew I wasn't going to get as much assistance there. And especially when recruiters came in to talk to students in high school, I ignored them. I didn't think that was an opportunity, a path that I was ever going to take. So I had to go back to the route that I ignored, and I went back to finding recruiters. And I found one nearby. And I ended up switching a couple of times trying to figure out who I really wanted to be with. That's a big thing too for people who pharmacy student or not are looking at that path. Sometimes recruiters are going to sell you on anything. They're looking to increase their numbers. They're looking for that next bullet point. And you are part of that bullet point, whereas others really do care. And that is very important that you just don't jump on the first hook, the first bait that comes to you it's important to look for somebody who actually is there because they want to be there. And so that was me just kind of looking around. And I finally found one person who he was adamant, like you're here for school money and you want this deal and that's it. Mm. So that was really awesome. When I found my, my recruiter at the time, his name was Sergeant center. He's now retired and rides his Harley every day. He's living a great life. But when I talked to him, he would frequently like, take his time, come down to Ohio Northern, which was an hour drive from where he was. And that's my biggest tip is find a recruiter, but make sure it's one who really cares about you or as well as somebody who's already done it. They can tell you the ins and outs, the good, the bad, the ugly. And those two are your best avenues to kind of get that information. For me, I had Google and Sergeant Center. So that was was the only way I was able to get my information. That's great, Alexis. I'm, I'm, that was one of my hopes of bringing you on the show was to share and celebrate you know, your story, but also I suspect for, for many that are listening, perhaps some that are even currently in school, may, maybe not thinking of this as an opportunity. And you know, I, I didn't know, for example, that it really matters you know, what recruiter you talk to. I, I kind of had this impression all information is, is equal and consistent. So just being able to have someone like yourself to reach out to, to ask questions, to point in the right direction, I think can be really helpful. You've already achieved, Alexis, two firsts on the YFP podcast. One being that we've never had anybody that has sold cows to go to pharmacy school. So that's a first. And only folks that maybe grew up in our area will will understand that. And second being, you know, you're the first person we've had on the show that has combined, uh, that at least we featured combined this uh, pathway in the army 
with being able to graduate from debt free. So really, really excited for you. Were, were there other branches of the military that you were considering? I, I know often, you know, when I talk about being able to consider, you know, military pharmacist positions and how that relates to student loan debt, I kind of talk broadly about positions here. We're talking specifically about a role in the army. So talk to us about what, was this an obvious choice or were there other, other branches of the military you were considering? So the two options that offered the National Guard near me to be able to pay for school in the manner were the Air Force and the Army. And I'm going to be honest, I never once looked at the Air Force. Hindsight, when we are in the field and we haven't showered and it's hot and we're miserable, sometimes I think maybe I should have looked at the Air Force. But I definitely will say when I was 17 and looking for that path, Maybe my ego got the best of me and I wanted to be in the Army instead of the Air Force, whereas in our world, we called the Air Force the Chair Force. And <laughs> I, I look at that now and I'm like, that's so stupid. Like, why did we why did we think that way? And why did I think? But I, I wouldn't take anything back. But that was I looked at the Army simply because of its reputation and the ego behind it. I hate saying that, but it really is the reason why. Tell us more about the specifics of joining the army and how that allowed you to graduate debt free. I'm thinking here about like the requirements, you know, of service, the time commitment, you know, how the how the stipends w- work or the tuition reimbursement. T- tell us more about the ins and outs of how that service in the army ultimately allowed you to graduate from Ohio Northern, a uh, great school. I'm a little bit biased, but a great school and, and to do that debt free. So the way it begins when you first join in order to get the four years for school credit, it's good at any, at least in Ohio, it's good at any public school in the state. And then it will do the max public school amount going to any private school. So it does fluctuate year by year of what you can get. But in order to get that four years, theoretically for your undergrad, you have to commit six years. And that six years is the moment you sign the dotted line until six years later. So even when you're not completely doing a whole lot and you're still waiting to go to basic training, that still counts towards your time in. So I had about, I want to say seven months like that, that still counted towards my six years, but I really wasn't, I wasn't doing what I'm doing now. With that, with the six years, you're able to get 13000 about per year through your scholarship. So mine fluctuated sometimes a little over, a little under, but on average, I was getting 13000 for four years sent automatically to my school. If you were at a public school per se, it would be entirely covered. They cover the max there. And then because I was a full-time student, I automatically was able to get the GI Bill. So my GI Bill was about 400 per month. And then following the GI Bill, you had your drill pay. So drill pay is like when you go in every single month and you do your work. So it could be anywhere from two days to four days. So I want to say my longest was a week. While you're doing it, it's a little tough, but the paychecks are really nice when you get it. But anyway, drill pay, where I was at, average ranking, it depends where you're at in your rank and how long you've been there. But you can expect to make anywhere between 300 to 600, potentially more on your drill pay per month. And then once a year, you do two weeks, typically out of the summer, and that's your annual training. And on annual training, you can expect to get about 1,500. So in total, in the one year that you're there between your scholarship, your GI bill, your GI bill, you just get for being a full-time student. You really, you do not have to do anything for the GI bill except call the VA and say, I'm a full-time student and this is my school. Mm -hmm. And then drill pay and annual training pay combined, you can make about 23,000 per year just from being on that. And then as well, wherever you're at, any school, regardless, you get to tack any other scholarships you receive on top of that. Oh, wow. So that's okay. why at Ohio Northern, I was able to do really well because I was able to tack on, especially during undergrad, my 19000 a year that I got from ONU to that twenty three, to where suddenly I was paying minimal, less than $1,000 per year in my first four years of undergrad wow. to go to school. Wow. And, and so therefore, the, the, the cows could handle the rest of that, right? We could get down to the zero balance. <laughs> yeah. The cows, the internships, the on-campus job, that was yeah. easy to manage. So how were you, you know, when I hear you say on-campus jobs, you obviously had requirements here through the army. You know, when I, when I was in pharmacy school, granted, you're obviously more, more mature uh, than I was at the time, but I, I felt like it was all in on time and effort just to be able to get through pharmacy school and to do that well. 
you know, here you've got the commitment piece in the army. You mentioned other on-campus work requirements. I'm guessing you were involved in other things as well. Talk to us about how the balance of this works and, you know, were, were you ultimately able to feel like you were, you know, going through pharmacy school and completing that well while also filling your other service obligations? There were different times, especially, I want to say my third year was when I really started to experience a few of the challenges of the service obligation combined with pharmacy school. Everything else seemed, especially on campus with sports and organizations and work, it all just seemed to bend to the whim of pharmacy school. Pharmacy school always trumped that. It never seemed to get in the way. But it, with the military, it's kind of like taxes. You you don't get to say no, even if it's a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. So there were days starting in my third year when school started getting more intense and I started picking up more rank in the military that I could be gone out of school for a week at a time. There was a point when I was gone for almost 10 days and then you come back and you're like, hi, what happened? I've been <laughs> gone and your, your inbox is full. People are emailing you. Where are you? And you're like, mm -hmm. I didn't even have a phone for the last 10 days. Like, I don't know what's going on. So those were the really challenging times. And just kind of missing things of like rearranging things with professors of like, hey, the exam is Friday. Mm -hmm. I'm leaving Tuesday and I won't be back until next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. So it was a lot of take it. My third year, I took everything early. I think every quiz, every exam was like, oh, I'm here five o'clock at night to take my quiz three days before everybody else. It was kind of at that point when I realized I didn't necessarily have to be at the same point as everybody else. And I know, like, especially with type A personalities as pharmacists and pharmacy students, you really get caught in that pressure of sure. that person A did this and person A was able to do all these other things. And person B got an A in this class and an A and I wasn't going to be a 4.0 student. And that was the hardest pill for me to swallow was mm -hmm. that I couldn't be all these other things because I had this one nagging thing that a lot of other people didn't necessarily have. Right. That, that was the hardest part is to kind of realize you can't compare. Mm -hmm. And I really think we get caught in that comparison game. And so that was, that was when I realized, like, I'm not going to be a 4.0 student anymore. I have to make it through, do my best. And as long as I put in all the effort that I could put in, use all the energy that I had, I couldn't be ashamed of myself at the end of the day. As long as the effort I know I couldn't have put in anymore, I couldn't be upset with that. Yeah. And Alexa is arguably more important than, than your grades is what you learned about yourself through this journey. And, you know, I think I've come to appreciate that more and more since being out of pharmacy school, where in that moment, as you mentioned, especially I think in a very competitive program, it's very easy to, you know, draw that peer comparison. It's very easy to get caught up in that, but big picture, I'm, I'm hearing you talk and talk about your journey. And I can tell there's a lot of self-discovery, you know, through that journey. And, and one thing I wanted to hit on specifically is in the post you put on LinkedIn, you know, you had mentioned that you were enticed by the idea of the GI Bill and tuition assistance with your original plan is that you're going to do the bare minimum, get your degree paid for, get in, get paid, get out. But then you would later say, you know, good things come to those who put in the work. Bare minimum is not the kind of person I am or will be. So that that's a significant jump from where you started mindset wise to where you kind of ended. T tell me more about that and what you learned about yourself during the journey. I guess when I started, I first looked at strictly money and that's all it was about. It was only about money. Mm. I felt like some people go through the military and they're like, oh, I love my country. It's all, I felt like I didn't have a patriotic bone in my body. I just wanted that money to get my farm beat. <laughs> I, there was no like family history. There was no massive drive, like no bald eagles cried when I woke up. It was, it was money. Honestly, whether you put in the max effort or the minimum effort, you're still going to get the same amount of money in the end. And that's mm. where I was looking at it and was like, okay, I don't have to do anything spectacular. I just have to get in, do the bare minimum, get out, show up one week in a month. I don't have to do anything extra and I'll still get paid. Mm -hmm. But then the more that I was there, I hate saying it, but it's always the toxic leaders that you seem to learn a lot from, the best leaders and the toxic leaders. Mm -hmm. And I saw in that environment, there were some that were absolutely phenomenal people. And they busted their tail every single weekend we were there. And even in the times outside, like they just really cared about people. They really cared about their small part-time job. But then there were other people who I could tell had only received their leadership roles and promotions because they'd been there long enough. And they were running out of people to promote. And that to me, I was like, wow, 
Like there are people like you here taking care of soldiers, young individuals, and you're trying to mold their minds. Mm -hmm. And this is how you're acting. And I, I just felt like that wasn't, it wasn't a strong environment to be in, but I saw that there were enough people that really did care. And I was like, I want to be like those people. And I always like to tell myself that I'm going to just show up and sure, I'll do the minimum. That'll be fine. I never end up doing that. So I should have known it, I was not going to do the minimum. But basically, I just, I always wanted to help out the people who were doing so much. And then it came down to a lucky break. There was an extra spot to hit a promotion. And I had all of my stuff turned in. I was just waiting for a slot to come up. And out of 150 some people, I was the only one in the position waiting for it. So I was able to nab my first promotion, my E5 sergeant at two and a half years. And that again is not very common either. And then I just kind of took the same steps into the next role. And as I always like to kind of just tell my own soldiers, you have to stay hungry because there's people around you that aren't. Yeah. You're getting out of this what you put in. And there are people who want to improve themselves, but then there are people here who they don't care. And you can easily go around those people. You should want to be better than those people because that's the legacy you're going to leave. When you leave here, mm -hmm. people are not going to remember who you were or they're going to remember who you were, probably not have very good things to say about you. And that's where you kind of have to worry about the impact and the impression you're leaving. I'm sorry, that was a very long-winded answer. No, that... That was fantastic. And, you know, the thought that came to mind as you were speaking there, Alexis, is that we, you know, we, st we stand on the, the shoulders of the folks that have provided us opportunities and led before, before us. And so you talked about great leadership and not so great leadership, which obviously we can learn from. And now you've got an opportunity to pay it forward, you know, with, with your soldiers, but also, you know, to the folks that are listening, others in our profession that, that I think are certainly going to look up to you and, and the work that you've been doing. So I, I appreciate you, you sharing that. So if I'm doing my math right, you mentioned six years of a commitment from signing the dotted line, a little over four and a half years in, you were a pinned staff surgeon. You mentioned to me before the show started that you're, you're getting ready to make a move from uh, Ohio to Boston. So tell me, we got a little over a year left in your six year commitment. And I'm trying to kind of understand like, what, what is the career path? What's the trajectory as you think about this transition from student to, to new practitioner? and where the intersection of pharmacy and the work that you're doing in the army. Tell us more about what lies ahead. So the way I arranged my contract and the choices that I made, granted, I am a doctor and theoretically people, once they get a bachelor's degree, master's degree, doctorate will advance into the officer realm. But because of the choices that I had made earlier on and chose to stay enlisted, I will be a doctor and a truck driver all at the same time. And some people think that's a little bit out of a choice. But for me, I wanted that flexibility. So I only have that year and a half left. But had I chosen to go an officer route, I would have had a bit more of a commitment. Okay. And I just, I wasn't sure where I wanted to be tied with it. And I do have the option. If I really wanted to commission, I most definitely could. I could drop my packet, the packet to go commission and go officer route. And I could be in in the next year. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm not committing that time yet. Just because I don't know where, especially with residency and potentially a PGY too, and really where life is going, I don't necessarily know where that's always going to fit in. So I have stayed enlisted to give myself that flexibility to get in, get out. But since I started in Ohio, and that's where my first unit was, and I am moving to Massachusetts, I have met phenomenal people who will live in a different state and then fly back to their drill weekends. I knew a man from Arkansas, and he would come up once a month to Toledo, where we would drill and work. I'm not that tough of an individual. I don't want to catch a flight. I don't want to deal with it. So I ended up transferring to a unit in Massachusetts, but I'm in the process of doing that now. So you pretty much fill out a bunch of paperwork and transfer. So I'm in that process of waiting to get picked up in Massachusetts and I'll stay there until I leave. And right now I don't have any intentions of following that commitment past six years. Okay. Just because I, I don't know where my career will take me, but I really... I don't think the door is closed yet. Mm -hmm. I think I will probably come back as an officer once I have a more stable location and more stable job other than a residency. But for now, we're going to put it on pause. And so am I following correctly, Alexis, you'll be doing residency while you're continuing out the, the six years of the commitment. Is that correct? Yes. 
I will be doing my residency as well as finishing my commitment out in Massachusetts. Awesome. I love that. So I, I think, not I think, I know your journey is going to be an inspiration to, to so many. And as I shared with you before we hit record, you know, this is a topic we don't talk often enough about of the intersection, I think, between the health services and, you know, opportunities in the military and to serve our country and obviously how that can intersect with one's financial plan here as we talk about being able to graduate debt free. And I'm confident that several people are going to listen to this and say, Hmm, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about that, but I don't know where to get started. And so my question for you is, you know, I don't want your email to get inundated necessarily, but for folks that, you know, want to follow you and your journey, wh- where is the best place that they can go to do that? They can obviously go ahead and connect with me on LinkedIn. My LinkedIn, my name is Alexis Miller, kind of hard to find, but if you go to the linkedin.com slash in slash a Miller X, it's a play on a Miller RX. No one gets it. I thought it was funny. No one else did, but that's where you can find that. And then of course I will give out my email. I don't get too many emails. It is a dash Miller dot 19 at O N U dot E D U. I'm not always the fastest on my email, but I will try to get back as soon as possible. Awesome. We will link to both of those in the show notes. And, you know, I'm so grateful for your time. Uh, again, thank you for your service. Thank you for taking the time to share your story with our community and uh, Dr. Alexis Miller, a staff sergeant, uh, really appreciate your, your time and uh, the contributions you've made here. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. As we conclude this week's podcast, an important reminder that the content on this show is provided to you for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. Information in the podcast and corresponding material should not be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any investment or related financial products. We urge listeners to consult with a financial advisor with respect to any investment. Furthermore, the information contained in our archive newsletters, blog posts, and podcasts is not updated and may not be accurate at the time you listen to it on the podcast. Opinions and analyses expressed herein are solely those of your financial pharmacist unless otherwise noted and constitute judgments as of the dates published. Such information may contain forward-looking statements, which are not intended to be guarantees of future events. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. For more information, please visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash disclaimer. Thank you again for your support of the Your Financial Pharmacist podcast. Have a great rest of your week.